I'm Abby Ward from Pulse Point Group. Um, I'm sitting here with Lenora Billings Harris, who just gave an excellent presentation on bias in the workplace and how communications leaders can reconsider some of our practices in order to avoid some of those biases and provide equal opportunity. So thank you for being here. Really loved all of your conversation and your coachings. Um, the first thing I wanted to ask you about is just um, kind of how leaders in the audience here today and just kind of generally in communications especially, how they can influence a lot of the leadership decisions to bring more diversity to the workplace. So the first thing that comes to my mind for any leader, even if they're not in communication, in the communication field specifically, is what people want to know is what is your personal experience? Why do you as a human being think this is important? I mean, you don't have to pour your heart out, but oftentimes I see executives stating the numbers, giving the business case, we know that businesses do better when they have more diversity. People sort of know that already, but they don't know how to make that happen. And so they want to know why does this make sense from the leader's perspective? And it may be things like, the light bulb really went on when I realized I had a uh, child with special needs or when my son came out to me as gay uh, or whatever the diversity is, but make it personal so that people know you're coming from a human place as well as a, a business place. And then from the communication um, direction specifically, be mindful of the gender heavy words that we tend to use. That is, for instance, if we're, we're describing something as we want to go get her, that's a male kind of word. And if you're looking for women to be present and to speak up, they may not always see that as an opportunity for them. So think through what the words are that you're using. And you're not going to know them off the top of your head because so much of this is unconscious. But get a group of people together and look at the words that you're using and see how you might change it. Now, speaking about language and um, kind of the diversity of the team and how that's affected by the words that you're choosing when you speak to the team, uh, we're facing an increasingly global workforce, and so the people we are interacting with are from various cultures. How, what are some tips that you have for how leaders can kind of manage those nuances in their communications with their teams? That's, I love this question because I do a good deal of my work via Zoom or Skype or Facebook, you know, with teams around the world. And one of the things that I recommend is whenever possible, bring that team together, that, bring that team together visually. So use uh, whatever the platform is so that people can see each other, set up the rules ahead of time so that people are not talking over each other. And then when you have Western culture, which generally is more assertive, so not everybody, but generally more assertive than Eastern culture. When you have people from other cultures, if you set the rules up ahead of time where you need to raise your hand or push the little button that shows that you have something to say, then people will be more likely to jump in. When you have people together live that are cross-culture or cross-gender, you know, different gender, those that jump right in get the attention. And others who usually have the best ideas don't want to fight the noise. So as a leader, you need to be mindful of bringing everyone in. And if someone is particularly quiet, you can do two things. One, ahead of time, let that person, ahead of time of the meeting, let that person know you really want to hear their ideas so that they know you're going to call on them. And then, so they have time to think about it, and then uh, call on them and go back to them if you see other people are talking over them. You have to set the example. And over time, the rest of the team will become more mindful of that as well, especially if you then make it a topic of conversation in general so that everyone realizes that we have a short period of time, we want to get as many ideas as possible, and we all need to be mindful of the time that we're using and how much time, how much of that air time we take up in our own responses. I think that's a, that's a really helpful information for, for people who are managing some of the conversations on your team. Um, I'm curious, for a lot of the communicators here, many of them are dealing with external stakeholders and having to coach their teams to interact with them. When they're considering the dynamics on their team and particularly hiring, how can we manage our bias 
to um, both assess how people are able to interact with those external stakeholders, but also maintain awareness of our own biases and how we interact. Yes, so before you even get started pulling the team together, you want to have a conversation with all of the folks that are making decisions around who's going to be on that team and identify some of the systematic biases that might be built into your process. So for instance, one of the things we talked about was to do blind, um, blind hiring or blind resumes where you redact certain information um, because we have bias around name and around um, what part of the country a person is from or which country they're from when you're looking globally. Um, so you can, and again, look at the words that you're using on the resume when you're looking for people in the first place. So play with some of those words and see, begin to see, um, see how the responses will be different. When you're putting together teams of people who are then going to be calling on your stakeholders, whether they're external to the company or internal, oftentimes we go to the people who are most like us. So that person that has a firm handshake, just like we do, or the person that is tall, just like I am. And those are biases. So again, you want to discuss that ahead of time um, with your team that's making the decision or if you personally are making the decision, make sure that both on the resume and on all the ways people can apply, as well as in the uh, calibration discussions that you're focusing on competency. What is it the person has done? And when people use terms or, or make comments like, well, we don't want to send Rosemarie on this assignment because she's going to have to travel and you know she's got two small kids. Call that out. Because the person saying it was not trying to be mean. They're trying to make the right decision, but they haven't talked to the woman. So call, call those things out and they become more evident. And most critically is people need to know it's safe to call those things out, so they need to see the leaders doing it first and the leaders need to ask for others to call those things out as well because the leader isn't going to see everything. Now, speaking of calling things out, and I, I'm personally, to disclose, I am personally very interested in the response for this because it's my pet peeve when I'm sitting in meetings and I say something that I find very intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not biased about that. Not at all. <laughs> Completely objectively. <laughs> and the person next to me says it in a different way, but meaning the same thing, and they get the credit for the, for the idea. Um, and so I'm curious, what are some ways that, that you coach people to have that conversation and call it out without kind of being, uh, without being too aggressive about yes. it? Yes, yes. Well, a couple of things. One is, um, hopefully you have some other people on the team that are your allies, uh, particularly if you're feeling this is happening because of your female voice or what have you, have other allies on the team, male or female, who when they see it happen, they can circle the conversation back to you. So that's one way you can do it. Sometimes, right in the moment, and sometimes if you can use humor well, um, and it always depends on what exactly was said, because um, people most of the time are not doing that intentionally. It happens so quick. And so after that person steals your idea, then see other people's responses, and then somewhere in there say, you know, Bob, I'm so glad you liked my idea. I appreciate how you kind of, you massaged it a bit. So you're kind of giving the person a compliment, but you're educating the team on what you just said. So that's one thing. As it relates to giving feedback to someone who may do that on a regular basis, um, what you first want to do is to own the problem. Because it's bothering you, it's not bothering the other people, because they don't even realize they're doing it. However, you do need to get them to change their behavior. So one of the techniques that I happen to teach is called STOP, the, the acronym STOP. S stands for state the behavior. So you want to say specifically, so let's say the person's name was George, and it could have been Mary, I mean, it, it could be anyone who had stolen your idea. But let's say the person is George, and you would say to George, George, in the meeting, when you said, and then you repeat essentially what he said, after I had said something similar, so he's very clear what you're talking about. So you state the behavior. The next, the T is tell him how you feel. 
this is not your opinion, this is not company policy, because that'll make defenses go up. So I felt excluded, I felt not heard, I felt whatever it is. And it's important that you share your feeling because human beings don't, most of them, don't want to hurt people's feelings. So the third is options. What do you want George to do instead? And then you're gonna tell him. Next time I share an idea, actually, if you would give me direct eye contact when I'm sharing that idea, then I know you and I are on the same wavelength. That could be an example of what you might say. And then third, the key is positive results. What's in it for him to change his behavior? And you have to, again, make that specific to the situation. I think we're gonna work better together. I know that we can, make a, we can become a stronger team, whatever that might be. This is not intended to be a conversation. This, when you do it really well, it takes about 45 seconds, but here's the catch. It's easy to remember what STOP stands for. It's not simple to apply unless you've practiced it. So I encourage you to write it out, literally write it out, practice it with a friend so that you can get rid of the emotion attached to it. So by the time you call him on it, and you don't want to do it on the spot, you want to give yourself a little bit of time because it, remember this is bothering you at, a, at an emotional level. So you want to give yourself a little bit of time, not too much, practice it, and then just and say to George, George, I got something I want, to, I want to share with you. And then go right into the stop technique. Now, I, I take two hours to teach that whole thing, but that's, that's the quick and dirty of it. That's still very helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this conversation has been illuminating, as was your session, and just thank you so much for joining us today. It was really, really a pleasure to have you. My pleasure, and the group was fabulous, very interactive, so I appreciate that. Thank you.